I'm a feminist, um, but when I saw that you'd gone to Lizzo without me last night with your um, superstar, um, long-term friend, Hollywood star, fellow Guilty Feminist co-host, Susie Wakoma, um, who you described as um, my best wife, <laughs> I felt deeply jealous and wished you'd had a terrible time. Oh, no! Just Don't owe me. I'm still wishing and hoping you had a bad time. Oh, we had such a good time. I'm oh. really sorry. I'll tell you what, I got a text from her just going, any chance you're free tonight? You're probably not. And I went, do you know I am? And the work I was going to do, I could not do. What is the thing? And she said, it's Lizzo. Lizzo. The and she, final night of the whole tour. She'd been invited into a fancy box, though. Yeah, that's not making it better for me. Sorry. <laughs> and there was, like, free drink in the box and stuff okay, like that. Okay, thank you, Debs. And then I'll I was... I'll just sip my tea. No, <laughs> I was a plus one, though. I was a plus one. And I did, I, I, you know, I was just, you know, sort of doing that wry thing because Susie's one, definitely, definitely one of my closest friends. So when I said my best wife, it was only after I posted that I went, I wonder if anybody else will think, oh, best wife, interesting. And I thought, no, it's don't, me. So, it's me who thought I'm it. Not, <laughs> it's, it's. But, oh. I, I, no, I genuinely thought, don't have such an ego, Deborah, that anybody else would give a fuck that you're calling Susie your best wife. And it turns out, yeah. it was a dagger to your heart. Dagger through, dagger through the Let heart. Let me pull it out and say, you are also one of my best wives. Oh, Equal the wording was too careful there. <laughs> I, or too, your politics is too good. You do and I'm a feminist, but because oh, I'm no. afraid I'm on a theme here. No! No, I was... The thing is, I have got some I'm a feminist butts from Lizzo, but... Oh, I see. I promised to save them for Susie. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Because I thought we were going to do them together. I'm so sorry, this really hurt. Don't touch me. No. Oh, no. No. I'm going to plan a really good hen night for you, though. I've already promised to plan your hen night. And I wouldn't do that if you weren't a best wife. One of my very best wives. Would I? Plan the hen night for dreams. Okay. I haven't planned a hen night for Susie. Is she engaged? No. 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 Not as such. (laughs) Will my hen night be better than the last night of Lizzo's tour at the O2 in the fancy box of free booze, Debs? I will make sure it is now. Do you think you can get Lizzo to come or...? I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what's happened. Yeah. You've just significantly upped the ante on what your hen night's going to be. Yeah, because it was just going to be MDMA and bowling in Margate. It was. (laughs) (laughs) To be fair, it's what she asked for. She asked for bowling in Margate. She said just fish and chips and bowling in Margate. She said, I don't want to fuss. Now it's got to be in a private box of the O2. And And Mm. it's got to be equal to or better than Lizzo. And that's a tough old ask. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm going to... Listen... I'm telling you, I'm going to find something that is great, e- equal to or greater than. I remember this is my primary school maths. That I'm telling you, your fan night's going to be, it's going to go off. You're all invited. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but whenever other people went on about how hot Harry Styles was, I used to say, yeah, he's lovely, but he's so boyish. Like, if I were in a situation with him, I wouldn't know whether to snog him or breastfeed him. <laughs> but lately, I would. I would know. Oh, which is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a... It's I've a developed, kiss, a little I kiss on the face. I'm developing a fetish. I'd like a um, kiss on his mouth. Would you? Yeah. yeah. But I'd be open to the sort of... But also, I don't think I want to fall in love. I like a quick kiss on the mouth. I don't think I want to do any more. Maybe like a frolic in a... Like, just frolic like in run a around. Field. Run around a field. Maybe take turns doing piggybacks. <laughs> like, it feels oh, quite innocent. Take I don't... turns doing piggybacks. If, yeah. If Harry Styles offered to give me a piggyback, I'd be so self-conscious. I don't want him to piggyback me. Harry Styles, if you're listening... Do not invite me on a piggyback situation. Either way round, um, you're, you're really big, strong dog. You've got the weightlifting. I would be fail on both counts. However, he's, I don't know if it's whether he's morphed from boy into a man or I've just got hornier. Yeah. Something's gone A little on. bit of both. Likelihood, a little bit of both, Debs. I'm now imagining whether or not I could get him right up my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> carry on. Carry on. <laughs> Am you, I he- you go. Oh, you great. Go. Um, I'm a feminist, but um, when I read that you'd also jumped out of a plane with Susie Wakoma... <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I thought, oh no, the most exciting thing we've ever done together is stayed up talking past midnight in a nice hotel near Woking. <laughs> and my Fucking jealousy hell. Now did I have to organise skydiving for 12 comedians. Yes, it's, it's, I am scared what's... of heights and edges up high. So I would probably rather perhaps a scuba trip. <laughs> Is this head night now in the Maldives? Yes. Okay, all right. Listen, I'm open to it. I'm going to make your dreams come true, baby. Uh, I'm a feminist, but... Um, oh. Yeah, here we go. You've got to make that noise. Someone opens a can, you've got to go... Ah. I taught my son that by the age of two. <laughs> um, I'm a feminist, but... Gary Lineker... Whoa! Get your principles out. Get your principles out. Get your principles out for the girls. Get your principles out for the girls. Integrity is sexy, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know. I never saw Gary Lineker, and I don't mean to objectify a man who's just doing the right thing. Absolutely brilliant on Twitter for ages. I just, you know, integrity is hot. There's no getting around it. Oh yeah. Um, If you're listening internationally, and so are crisps. (laughs) <laughs> yep, no, that's true. He does advertise for He's associated himself oh, with sorry. excellent things for years. For, oh, I see. You found him hot because he had crisps. Yeah, before he, never, the he would carry them around and there I'd be. <laughs> no. I, yeah. So Gary Lineker, if you're listing internationally, is a footballer slash football... 30 years, I think, on the BBC oh, Football Commentary. surely they've and heard of Gary. I don't know. Everyone around the world won't have heard of Gary. Mm. And he <laughs> recently... Uh, responded to a very uh, draconian policy about refugees uh, from this government with a response and and the BBC went, oh, you're not impartial. Impar- Why does he have to be fucking impartial? He's a football commentator. He's not a, he's not a newsreader. He's not an interviewer on Newsnight. Absolutely ridiculous. And so they said, you're, you're going to be suspended until you apologise. And so everybody said, uh, match of the day, which is the big football show here, fuck it, well, we're not coming to work either. And the whole, I think the crew and everyone just well, no, we're not coming in either. And the BBC went, oh, we've oh, fucked up. Sorry, <laughs> come back. But in doing so, I have mildly objectified, not in a bad way. And the football chant that I was singing is usually used to be "Get your tits up, get, get you can't even your bring yourself tits to up, chant it. get your tits up for the lads." Yeah. And I cleverly turned it into "Get you principles out for the girls." Now, yeah. it does a it wrong? Very earnest version, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know what else I want him to get out. Yeah, um, I don't want him to get anything else out. I don't want no. him to get things out. I no. was going to say <laughs> cock and balls. I was going to say. But don't you don't want that. No, I really don't want that. I can see. I really respect him, but he, yeah, he must keep them. Even before I had, <laughs> even before I'd explored, he'll ruin everything if he just starts getting his cock out much of the day. <laughs> You'll get me too. One of the only good ones. Like, yeah. but I. I thought a request had come in from a really <laughs> feminist podcast. Feminist podcast. <laughs> no, yeah, I've taken that too far, Tom. Edit that out, because... He doesn't, know. He thinks it's funny to leave it in. So this podcast is apparently is just full of us going, can you edit that out, and him not doing it. Um, I'm a feminist, but... Yeah, I'm, yeah. When I saw um, that you had also gone... <laughs> Not only skydiving and uh, so to Lizzo's final night of it all, but also to Abba Voyage with Susie Wacoma. I thought, nah, fine, actually, really glad you got someone else to do that with. <laughs> yeah. I thought, I've really lost them now when they don't let us know. like, that's too no. far. We accept no. that you were the plus one to Lizzo. We understand the nature of the skydiving. But Abba Voyage, you've crossed a line, Deborah. <laughs> No, that one. Stick it up your ass. Glad you had someone else to go with. <laughs> I really thought when they groaned, I was like, oh, fuck, I fucked it. Um, it's incredible. I've lost... Yeah, I have lost a few ABBA fans. I could sense... No, I'll really tell you what. I'll tell you what. Tom Selinski went. And Tom Selinski... I've never heard Tom Selinski ever mention ABBA. He wouldn't dance to ABBA at a wedding. He's not interested in ABBA. He's yeah. just not... He went to Abba Voyage. He was invited by a mate for his birthday, and I was like, oh, he's just gone along to a thing. He won't enjoy the Abba Voyage part. He'll mm. just enjoy the you know, friends and drinking to part. He te- I texted him all about how was Abba Voyage, and he went, sell a kidney to get a ticket if necessary. I thought, what? obviously, that's hyperbolic exaggeration. In other words, he hated it. So I said, oh, was it that bad, was it? He went, no, I mean it. And he walked in there and said, you have to see it. You have to see it. So we went, and... He- <laughs> It actually put me into an existential crisis 
Because what is even is death? What? Do you know what Abba Voyage is? It's holograms of the 1970s group, like the 1970s Abba, but they they're singing know now. Who Abba is? There's holograms of them brought back to life singing. Yeah. With a live orchestra. And what? Here's the thing with it. It's. You do they think, do other songs or it, just their songs? <laughs> it, 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 honestly, it doesn't matter. They could sing Pat a Cake, Pat a Cake, Bake a It is their Bake classic you. songs and some <sighs> new ones. However, like, imagine honestly, if you got there, like all the Abba classics and Baby Shark. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I tell you what. Yeah, I'm keeping my kidneys. <laughs> Both of them. Yeah. I'll t- just, I just need to say about it, though. Okay. Seriously, I just need to say, Jess, honestly, it's such an astounding thing. I know you're not allowed to film it, because, of course, you're not, but I think mm. you should be allowed to film your friends watching it. Because I looked down the row, and everyone was like, <gasps> like they'd seen a biblical resurrection. It was bizarre. And I know, you think to yourself, because I imagined holograms. I imagined sort of like a, you know, a sort of projected thing. It's like they're really there but then sometimes they walk off and they just disappear in fucking front of you it's in you just have to see it I'm not really allowed to talk more about it I've not because it just don't want to spoil it but it's it made me question what is death and on the way back Susie and I planned the hologram guilty feminist show that would happen after we died Susan you did but you'll be in it too you'll be a hologram in the guilty feminist you will all be will all be if you you don't want to go to Abba Voyage can you, would you be open you to... You can be a hologram in the future when you and Susie have passed away and I can be a cardboard cutout nearby. No! <laughs> oh, my God. Just a couple of holograms jumping out of planes and you can pop my cardboard cutout out. Uh, you can pop it up I in that hotel in Woking. I promise you, if, there is a, if there's a guilty feminist voyage after we've foyer. died or when we're old, you will be a lead co-host in Guilty Feminist. My corpse, reanimated, will have prestige. Yeah, I'm telling you. Okay. Um, have you got any more? No. Have I done three? Yeah. Great, then we're done. Um, <laughs> have I done three? Don't think I have. Um, have I? Uh, uh, no, I haven't. Mm, sorry. I haven't. God, that's two. not... Okay. I mean, I'm a feminist, but we just counted to five wrong. Okay. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I promise to never again get in a back and forth with a man on Twitter going, ooh, but also what about men? But only when a woman is talking about women things. But I thought, yesterday, this man was different. (laughs) And today, I concluded this reasonable exchange that turned into an incredible escalation by writing, I apologise for interacting with you I'd mistaken you for someone who'd replied in good faith. And then when he said ditto, I added the extremely mature lol. I think you've played that beautifully. I know, but why did I bother? Why did I go there? I've really You're very kind. I've always thought you had an incredible capacity for entering into conversation with people who were fizzing with challenge fizzing with challenge you know I mean I have got got no (laughs) Um, you you're really good for even trying thank you I don't often anymore because I just think it was just a waste of time but um, I did and I ended up here going I've mistaken you for somebody who'd entered this conversation in good faith I'm sort of tempted to get that on a tea towel really yeah Yeah, I I'm so sorry I've mistaken you for someone who's entered into this conversation with good faith. I just, it felt so good to write it. But then I childishly, I thought it was quite good, it was quite good, it was quite a good drop, mic drop line. And then he went, ditto. And I was like, because you can't think of a good comeback, you've just had to copy mine. Yeah. So I had to go, lol. And I should have just fucking left it, but lol. He, I bet he's written back as well. Got to find out. Should we have a look? <laughs> Live from King's Place in London. Oh, my 
my God, I'm so lovely to see you. I'll never, ever get used to coming in here and just having people sitting together, no masks. You know, I could touch, the, I could lick the front row if I wanted to legally. Oh, I just love it. I just love it. Even just coming into the building and it being just warm and buzzy and, ah, oh, just loving it. I'm just having a really nice time with normality. I never appreciated normality until someone cruelly ripped it away. And now I do. Can I lick anyone in the front row? Is anyone open to that? Don't po- Are you pointing at your husband? I don't know why I knew he was your husband. I just knew you from the look on your face. You went, he needs a good looking. And I'm not doing it. I've done enough this week. Was very much the implication. Uh, hello, welcome. If you're late, I'm in a good mood, and I'll just assume it's you're late because you were doing feminism and you were needed at a feminist emergency. I love that. I once was doing an LGBTQ plus gig with uh, Peter Tatchell. You know Peter Tatchell? Very famous human rights advocate. And (laughs) something was happening with Pride. I can't even remember what it was now. But he was meant to stay on and hang out and have drinks. But as soon as he finished his talk, he said to the audience, I'm so sorry, I've got to go and save a parade. And basically... (laughs) I was, I was like, my God, it's just like gay Batman. It was absolutely... Which, to be fair, gay Batman is also just Batman. Um, so, happy St. Patrick's Day. But, did you know that it's also St. Gertrude's Day? Patron saint of cats. If, if anything could be more feminist than patron saint of cats, Gertrude... Who none of us have ever heard of. Why? The patriarchy. (laughs) Have we heard of Gertrude of her pussies? No, because we're too busy thinking of Patrick and his snakes. This is how it begins. This is how it ends. So in honor of Gertrude, I thought, I've got to find out if there are any other feminist patron saints. Um, And do you know there are? At least there are, according to a website called Autostraddle. I'm not sure they can be entirely trusted. The title is Radicalising Cathedrals Way Before Pussy Riot Meets the Top Ten Feminist Saints. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, should we start with ten? Yeah. yeah. Maybe we should start with five, because obviously the, 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 it might take a while, might not, and I'm not, nothing against the bottom five, which I'm sure are great. Well, Joan of Arc only made seven. Well, this is the thing. This is the thing with your life. You can live it as well as you can, and you're still number seven. Um, Number five. Number five. I feel like David Ledgerman. Julian of Norwich. Yes. Yes. Do people know Julian of Norwich? Yes. So I studied Julian of Norwich when I was at university because she was one of the very first female writers and thinkers. And the reason she had to be a saint is because the way in those days women were allowed to say anything was to say... Um, I had a dream. God told me some stuff in a dream. And then people didn't want to go, shut up, in case, in case that had happened. And then they were saying to God, shut up. So it was the only way women could say anything. So it was the God told me in a dream defense. What I love about Amelia Lanya, there was a brilliant play about her, Amelia, is uh, she wrote this incredibly brilliant proto-feminist poem about uh, Jesus, long, long, long poem about Jesus, really funny. And I was like, God, how did she get away with it? Because it's Elizabethan, like Jacobean. Like, how, how did she not go down for blasphemy? But she said God gave her the title in a dream. And I thought, that's quite clever, because she's gone, I wrote the fucking poem, all right? <laughs> but if God titled it, he must be pleased with it. <laughs> See, I, I mean, women are so clever. Um, okay, so Julian Norwich, oh, not technically recognised by the Catholic Church. Uh, I don't think that's the worst thing they've done, guys. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, no, she didn't ever win the Oscar, but you think she did? You know that one of those? Yeah. She argued that God is both mother and father, and that Jesus had both motherly and fatherly characteristics. But I mean, I've always said this. I didn't say it before Julian of Norwich, because uh, she was born in 1342. But I, I have said it because I just think if we are made in God's image, if we're buying into the paradigm, God's got to be non-binary. It's obvious. Um, Claire of Assisi. Patron saint of social workers. Another young woman interested in uh, religious life, more interested in religious life than marriage. That's the other thing women did, of course. Um, They became nuns to avoid husbands. (laughs) Claire ran away from home, cut off all her hair, joined a convent. Now she joined a rock band. (laughs) 
soon joined by her sister Agnes. She sounds cool too, doesn't she? Um, in those days, convents were rock bands. Uh, I think this is what we're learning. Uh, became the leader of her own order. Wow, that was probably quite tricky in those days. Born in 1194, before Julian of Norwich. As an abbess, she was known for her dedication to poverty, and so was Mother Teresa. It doesn't prove anything. Um, <laughs> Uh, she wrote to various abbots and even the Pope in defense of the rule of life, the oldest monastic rule written by a woman. Well, the earliest one that's written down that was recorded and that survived. Most of everything women have has done has been destroyed or avoided or ignored. Sorry, I don't mean to depress you. It's Friday night. Uh, <laughs> it's Friday night! Do we know how to party or what? Okay, another feminist patron saint. Um... <laughs> Apollinaria, Dorotheus of Egypt... Getting earlier, four o, born in 408. Bloody hell. Patron saint of gender nonconformity. Yes. Wanting to avoid marriage. It's a big theme with these saints. Um, <laughs> she was allowed to go on a pilgrimage instead. One away from home. Imagine saying, I will fucking walk across a continent. I will walk to Egypt. So where she's from probably, it probably sounds like she's from Greece. I'll walk to Egypt rather than have that anywhere near me. I fully get it. I think it's brave and also just common sense. While away from home, Apollinaria went into hiding, donned monk's clothing and lived an aesthetic life, eventually joining a monastery. Oh, lived from then on as Dorotheus, only once revealing their former identity to their family in order to heal their sister. Unsurprisingly, accounts of Dorotheus' life don't mention their preferred pronouns. Yeah, that's probably... Yeah, it was four o, she was born in 408. <laughs> I, but I love the idea that someone was found a sort of a drawing, a crude drawing of her, you know, in a sense, and went, there's no preferred pronouns under this, which would just be great if underneath it said, it said, uh, he, him. Um, <laughs> he, him, slash they. Uh, number two, number two, feminist uh, saint. Quateria, fifth century patron saint of Pussy Riot. That seems unlikely, auto-straddle, unless you're using Pussy Riot in a different way. There's a lot of dispute about the details of her life. Yeah, clearly. Um, <laughs> but legend has it that her mother was so ashamed of having no sons that she ordered a maid to drown her nine infant daughters. Oh, my God. This is a horrible story. I'm sorry. This is, I should have skipped over this one. This is ruining your Friday night. However, I think it's going to have a happy ending. Don't worry. We're going to turn it around. The maid let the girls live, and they grew up to fight against the Roman Empire and their father, who wanted to marry them off to Roman officers. After refusing to marry and escaping imprisonment, Quateria continued to battle against Rome with her sisters until she was... Okay, didn't have a happy ending, but... <laughs> Listen, it had a happy middle, because she wasn't... The maid was like, fuck this, I'm not going to kill them. Then she fought, she became a warrior. Then she refused to get married, so did all of her sisters. Then... History doesn't relate. <laughs> History does relate, but you know. Oh, the number one. We got a number one. The number one feminist patron saint is. Any guesses? St. Catherine. Not St. Catherine. The, the very famous. Kate Blanchett. Kate Blanchett. Very good. <laughs> In fact, it was Mary, mother of Jesus. Oh. Very like Kate Blanchett, though. Um, <laughs> Kate Blanchett, from the first century patron saint of artificial insemination. <laughs> The writer of Autostraddle says in brackets, I'm probably going to hell for that. <laughs> While many female saints are celebrated simply for their virginity, Mary's case is a bit more interesting. Unlike all other humans who are considered sinful from conception, Mary was immaculately conceived. This is kind of a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Um, she was born free from sin. It's almost like Mary's proof that there's nothing inherently wrong with being female. Not to mention that she is a kick-ass example of how virginity is a completely arbitrary concept. Um, <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. Now, <laughs> listen, let me just say, I need to know who wrote this, uh, because it, it, oh, it's just some, by someone called Trees. <laughs> trees, we, know, we need to know who you are. You wrote this in 2013. Um, whoever Trees is, please write in. We'd love to get you on the show. Um, I'll see if Trees has got more of a name. Trees, no, just a name is just Trees, if you uh, click through. So uh, what I thought we could do is just... Um, are there any patron saints that you think should be and aren't currently? Or we don't know if there are or they aren't. But just a suggestion, because I thought I'd send a little DM to the Pope afterwards, because his DMs are open. <laughs> no, they are. They are. You can tweet the Pope. So I thought I'd put forward some suggestions. 
Um, any patron saints of, and you can have anything, you know, like it's, it's, you know, there's one for horses, there's one for lost things, there's one for, you know, fingernails probably. What, what patron, feminist patron saints you wish there were but aren't? Ada Lovelace. Sorry? Ada Lovelace, patron saint of computer says no. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Oh, same um, thing. Hedy Lamar. Hedy Lamar. Of Wi-Fi. Patron saint of Wi-Fi. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. I'm f- fascinating that you're actually putting forward candidates. I was just putting forward categories. I was going to leave it to the Pope to find because I thought he'll have a team to find <laughs> appropriate people. Like I was thinking the patron saint of the pay gap. Right. I thought we would need that, and then then they could, you know, they'll have a team on it, I'm sure. They'll, they can, candidates, they can interview candidates, that kind of thing. Um, but if, does it, it, or we could put forward people here. If, who would like to be the patron saint of the pay gap? Anyone? Does anyone think they have a particularly remarkable pay gap? Yes, you do. What's your name? Heather. Heather. Um, and Heather, what's your claim to the patron sainthood of pay gap? Um, for four years, I battled for a regrade. For four years, you battled for a regrade. I'm just saying it is the mic so people at home can hear. All male managers. Finally got a female manager. Finally got a female manager. Um, I've got a 20 grand increase. You've got a 20 Woo! grand increase, but you fought for four years. So uh, could you say your, your first name and maybe the area you're from, <laughs> either you're born or the place in London you live now or whatever? Um, Heather from Woolwich. So you are the Heather of Woolwich, yeah. the patron saint yeah. of the pay gap. Yeah. Putting it forward. Putting it forward. Heaven of Woolwich. Yes. What's yours? What's yours? Did you put your hand up? Oh, you were just going like that. Oh, that was just like a spiritual, like, it was sort of an open palm pump for Heather of Woolwich. I thought you were going, I've got one, I've got one. Has anyone else got anything else they'd like to see beatified? I think beatified is the bit before saying to Desmond. Oh. Are you open? <laughs> Someone in the audience just suggested you have to die to be a saint. There are no living saints then. Oh, no, you're right, you're right. Well, how about we do a retrospect, like Heather of Woolwich, when she dies, becomes. Okay. And listen, we're not doing anything to hasten that, although it would be good for the podcast numbers. Um, we don't want that. We don't want that. Um, what about but, all saints? What's that? All saints. All saints. Well, not the shop, though, the band, presumably. Yeah, the band. yeah, yeah, excellent. Anybody else got a candidate of a, of a category? Patron saint of? Patron saint of having your ideas nicked by a guy. Having your ideas oh. nicked by a man. Yes, that's good. I would love that because you, you're meant to be able to kind of quickly go, oh, you know, like that. Help me find my cat. Like, you know, you're meant to be able to do that. So patron saint. So when your idea is nicked by a man, you're meant to sort of reach out to the patron saint and she's meant to send you a bit of either power or comfort or something like that. Um, anybody think they're a good candidate for that? Has anyone had their ideas nicked by a man and found a way to grapple them back? <laughs> Everyone. Yeah. Everyone. Any, any techniques for grappling your idea back? I tell them thank you for agreeing with me. Oh, thank you for agreeing with me. That's good. That's really good. I've heard of a really good one, which is you have to do it in teams. It's a team sport. If you see it happening to one of your female colleagues, you go, yes, actually, I... What you've said, Graham, is great because, and when Sarah first pitched it, <laughs> and I'm so happy you're running with it. And if they've added a bit, comment on the bit they've added, yeah. and then reiterate to Sarah's idea. It, apparently, it was the young think tanks and consultants and advisors of Obama's that, that came up with this. They call it shine theory. Hmm. Um, so maybe it should. They should be when they die the patron saints of um, men fucking off. Um, <laughs> hashtag not all men but lots of them. Uh, normally I go look it's a minority of men but it's really not but in that one it's not um, it's a majority and if you don't do it you just think you don't you're the worst um, <laughs> do any men think they don't do it do any men think <laughs> just shout out if you think I really have really worked on it and I don't do it just shout out if you think you never did it just shout out if you so all the men in here do it and I'm happy about that. <laughs> You're like, I do it and I'm, I'm all right with it. I'm, I'm do it and I'm all right with it. That's just, you know. I, I steal equally from both men and women. I steal equally from both men and women. 
What a diver- what an equality champion. I do know better. What an equality champion we have in the audience. I am still eating from London. All right. This is the Guilty Feminist Podcast. Woo! If you've not been to a podcast before, it's like a TV or radio recording, except this. Okay, it's like a radio recording. Um, this is, if you don't know what you're at, it'll become apparent. Uh, <laughs> would you uh, like to meet my extraordinary co pilot for this evening? Woo! Then put your hands together and make incredible woohooing noises for the wonderful Jessica Foster Lovely business what? with the saint stuff. <laughs> well, that's really the, do you know what? That. I asked the question and then they just came rolling in. Right. How is that not incredibly funny? Are you too young to understand that joke? Oh, oh when the saints. Oh, when oh. the saints. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. The saints come rolling Thank in. You. Maybe I should have done it. Oh, oh there's yeah. marching. That's it. Your saints are okay. coming. That's <laughs> why it didn't work. <laughs> It tu- I thought it was you and it turned out to be me. Um, but I can admit that. I'm going to do it again. And could you fake laugh? Um, okay, everyone be quiet because otherwise the audience at home will know. This is why you come out to the live show. You see how the sausage is made. Okay. See how it's rolled. I mean... How it marches. <laughs> uh, okay, all right. Uh, yeah, I just uh, threw out the question. <laughs> Sorry, I got to know. Yeah, so shh. Yeah, I just threw out the question uh, about the saints and then the answers came marching in. <laughs> Boom! I dropped the mic, Debs, if I didn't, if I had less respect for the venue. <laughs> oh, well, Unfortunately, that so will not job. play on the podcast because no. that, an audience would titter at that. They wouldn't cheer. <laughs> so could you just... Could you, could you do a medium-sized I can't chuckle? She's making you do it again. To- I'm not going to do it again. I don't need to do it again. I smashed no. it. Oh, they need to do it again. Right. So I'm, going to do, I'm just going to say three, two, one, and you're going to do a medium-sized appropriate chuckle for that joke. I won't do a noise that ruins it. <laughs> if you could have, because it's a little punny, one person could groan. One person only. What's the name of the man that steals other people's ideas? What's your name? What's that? What? Dan. Dan, you are the only groaner. I'm giving it to you. <laughs> like you've heard it, you've gone, oh, an old song, a bit of a, you know. Everyone else finds it funny, but not so funny. There's a cheer, anything like that. It's just a medium-sized chuckle. Okay, ready? Three, two. <laughs> that was perfect. That was smashed, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. That was yeah. smashed. That's the appropriate amount of laughter for the third attempt at laughing. <laughs> comedians know about this about you can conduct the audience to laugh I think and you're the only one I've ever seen do it because I think if it, I think I think people I, think I love it I think I've got it they I think I should hate this technique they actually on you Debs to be like let's go again you can do better <laughs> I, I think I love can hate this technique yeah do you yeah because other, if other comedians found out that they would have to work a lot less hard if they could just do a bunch of ordinary jokes and then retake the laughter yeah. I suppose that's what sitcoms do isn't it that's what they do with canned... That's what canned laughter is. Yeah. I think I'm reinventing canned laughter live. <laughs> and then going, I think I could patent this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a feminist and. Okay. All right. Um, hello, anyway. Jessica Foster. Hello. How are you? I'm, I'm very well. And I'm yeah. loving that you're wearing your Girls, Girls, Girls t-shirt. Thank you. But it says, no. what does it say? Girls, Girls, Theys. Girls, Girls, Gays, Theys. Girls, Gays, Oh, theys. I've ruined it. Let me do it again. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> you were genuinely worried there, weren't you? You were yeah. like, oh my God, she's going to say everything twice. <laughs> this is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which... Undermine them. Undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White. With me is Jessica Foster Q, and we are talking about Section 28, but very specifically through the lens of a new film called Blue Jean, which is absolutely incredible. If you haven't seen it, you must see it. Yes. I insist, otherwise we're not friends anymore. Um, are you ready for some stand-up comedy? Woo! Then please welcome the stage my best wife. Yeah. <laughs> The one, the only, the incredible Jessica Foster Q! Hello. Um, these will be some short, very recent thoughts. Um, okay, so I had a terrible revelation recently in the sense that I've realised um, that I 
have been mistaking... Oh, I mean, I'm 39. For a long time, I have been mistaking um, the desire to get absolutely cunted. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, um, for example, like you had a big, big project has come to an end. Everything's signed off, sealed, it's done. The job, like, there's been high pressure, high stakes. It gets sent off. I get flooded with a feeling that's like, let's go! <laughs> I've mistaken the desire to get absolutely munted with um, what has turned out to be just normal physical human thirst. <laughs> yeah, I had some big jobs come to an end and I was like, whoa, I want, I want, I want, I want to do one drink. Or if I do want one drink, I want it to be 90% gin. Like, I want a big drink, I want a nice big drink. I was on my way to work, I was going to be driving to work. That's not very 2023. I'm like, I want a big drink. Stop to get some petrol anyway. Sorry, planet. Um, got a Fanta. <laughs> Did the job. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Very new thoughts, remember, be kind. Um, I was writing a joke, um, the punchline of which, this is going to upset some of you. <laughs> I was writing a joke, the punchline of which was Bowden Tankini. Mm. Um, and I thought, you know what? I'm a conscientious comedian. I don't want to write the joke. I need to check. You know, I need to know that the item exists in the world. So I Googled it. Long story short, there was a sale on. Now I own a Bowdoin Tankini. Um, um, well, actually, it turned out, I thought, God, it is bloody cheap. Uh, a friend, um, I was putting it, I put this online and a friend, a young friend in her early 20s, uh, Italian friend actually, started saying, what are you like? Like, what even is that? Blah, blah, blah. What have you done? And I thought, fuck her. You know, I'm going to look up the order and um, check and show her it. Because actually, I think it's a really, it was a really nice. And I'll show her a picture of it and she'll be like, yeah, fair fucks, actually, because that's so sexy. Not frumpy at all. Like, that. Anyway, I looked up the order, turns out oh, I, just, I just actually bought the pants. <laughs> um, so that's not that won't, I won't feel as frumpy like that will I <laughs> not with these old boys dangling loose <laughs> um, dangerous if anything wouldn't it them all flinging around all everywhere be like one of them wankers with their fireballs at a <laughs> festival <laughs> painful though not very practical eventually I'm hoping they'll get to a length of my tits where I can sort of flop them both over one shoulder <laughs> Or the end game, really, um, is to get, if you are just going to buy the pants, get some with pockets in and get boobs long enough <laughs> just to sort of tuck them in there. But what tickled me on reflection was like, why did my Italian friend not know what a tankini was? Mm. I think we've been diddled here, actually. I think what's happened is that the UK version of Mad Men, some ad agency, it's going to be a man, isn't it? It's going to be called Stuart. He's going to be all, he's going to be of pink hue. <laughs> He, at some point, has gone, I know exactly how. Do you know the man I mean? Have you met him? Yeah. He played rugby at school, but like mainly for the puss. He said, that's him. But he, he, at some point, has gone, I, I know exactly how to target women called Linda and Fife um, with a product, just pop Eni on the end. And someone will have gone, well, surely not a tank. They're like, yeah, tankini. <laughs> They'll think young Italians are buying it. Well, Linda and Fife, young Italians have never heard of it. If you don't believe me that they're doing this, case in point, Paolo Nettini. <laughs> I'll give it a matter of weeks before they're rebranding it as ITV Neat. <laughs> um, I've had a really exciting thing happen actually and this is a bit more reliable hopefully a stand up so you can all relax um, uh, fashion has come to me it keeps happening I don't know why anyone goes out of their way to go to fashion it's a waste of your time do you know what I mean like actually keep up with fashion and go and buy things that you think are fashionable if you stand still long enough it comes to you <laughs> All you got to do is stay in one place. Remember a couple of years ago, dungarees came back in. I already had them on. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's come my way even more now. Like, like not just clothes, actual... Uh, do you know what's fashionable right now that I've always had? Great big fuck-off scruffy eyebrows. Yes, please! <laughs> 50 quid people are playing to go to someone and have them scruff their eyebrows the wrong way and glue them in place there. 50 quid. Laminated, they call it. Fuck! <laughs> yeah, and you just do your own. You can do your own with a Brit stick. I was born this way. <laughs> and my favourite bit of fashion that was ever come to me, ever, do you know what is right in fashion right now? 
Great big fat ass. Yes! <laughs> People are paying thousands of pounds to have bits of their body removed and stuffed into their ass instead to make their ass bigger and bigger. I was born with it, baby! Um, and if you don't believe me, it's audio, so I'm not gonna bother like, doing sort of a display, um, but a brilliant thing happened recently. My son, he's seven now, quite tall, quite strong. He was creeping up behind me, I could sense it was happening, um, and he. I knew it was happening, so I tensed as well, which helped. He was going to give me a big, big kick up the arse. Um, he did it, really hurt his foot. <laughs> That's feminism. <laughs> um, yeah, and he's recently started um, Beavers. Yeah, if you don't know what it is, it's not all, it, it's, um, it's um, Scouts for younger kids, it's the beginning of Scouts, and um, if you're thinking, hang on, isn't that a bit like, you know, old fashioned, I was like, no, it's, it's very wholesome, and they have done a really good job of weeding out <laughs> the nonces. <laughs> they, ha they have done a really good job of making it very wholesome. Um, they haven't a hundred percent eradicated all creepiness from the system. For example, his Beavers group is run by two human adults who I know full well are called Jonathan and Sarah. But when we are at Beavers, I do have to call them Fox and Mole. <laughs> That's not, not creepy, is it, Beavers? Yeah, so there's a little bit of work to be done. Um, I was trepidatious about beginning um, Beavers, him doing it, because um, we're, oh, I'm agnostic, but his dad's quite sort of ferociously atheist, and they were like, well, isn't it really goddy? And what's interesting now is to make it more inclusive, you can do different oaths. You do like a swearing-in oath when you join Scouts, and um, now you can do different ones for all different types of faiths, and if you're agnostic or atheist, you can basically do one that says, I promise to be kind and give a fuck about the planet. Um, I don't think they say fuck, but they... Um, it's a nice oath. Um, uh, I'm not a brilliant parent. Luckily, my son witnessed one. Um, my friend Sam's a really good parent. And are, he, my son was able to witness um, his friend be parented well. And um, they, he could hear their parents saying, so when the prayers are happening, if it doesn't mean anything to you, the best thing to do is to just sort of be respectfully quiet. Um, and I, I didn't know he'd witnessed that. He'd taken that, my son, and him being him, he'd sort of put his own spin on it. He said, oh, I've, um, don't worry, by the way, about the prayers. Tell da Daddy not to worry about the prayers. I went, well, you know, it's up to you. What, uh, what, what are you thinking then? He went, yeah, I know exactly what I'm going to do. Um, to be respectful, but because they mean nothing to me. When they do start doing the prayers, I was like, oh, great, he's going to say it, I'm just going to listen. He went, as they start speaking, I thought I could go... Um, Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> no, no, you can't. You, no, please don't. Um, that's it, that's it. Jessica Fosco, everybody! Hey, oh. Can I? That was brilliant. Can I just ask I a question? I wouldn't say brilliant. The very early beginnings. Is no. the question cut out the nonce bit? You'll get complaints. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. Is, is the, Just is the, the word. Young, is the young scouts in the UK really called beavers? Yeah, they're beavers, five to eight year olds are beavers, and when you're eight, you become a cub. But no, I then remember I can't, in I don't Australia. Know what I can't remember what age you become a scout. In Australia, we had cubs and scouts, but for obvious reasons, we didn't have beavers. Oh, <laughs> my, um, my my what university like football it? team. Mingers. My, mingers. Mingers. <laughs> He is also a ninja, isn't he? He does ninja class, doesn't he? Yeah, not ninja. <laughs> he does, um, yeah, he goes, to, nin he goes be... to ninja school, yeah. Do you, do you know what I mean, though? Like, Beavers is... Two-year wait list for ninja school. <laughs> Where I live. Sorry. Yeah, Beavers I'm sounds trying like... I'm to get into ninja it school. It sounds... Yeah, Beavers is... A... Be... What's funny is Beavers another word for vagina. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, and yeah. there's small children. You wouldn't call it... Yeah, this would be... Yeah, yeah. you wouldn't call it muffs or... No, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like, actually, when I went to Girls' Brigade, I did Girls' Brigade, which is like religious girl guides. Girl guides with extra God. And it was... Um, instead, of getting, <laughs> instead of getting badges for, like, tying knots and doing tents, we got badges for, like, praying and self-flagellation. Oh. But... Oh, God. I thought I, that was a... Yeah, sorry. No, well, not really. That was a joke, and I oh. believe. There was no actual whipping of yourself, but... Fine. No, I mean... But we were, we, there was uh, some, they would call it a Mufti week. Oh, what? And that's when, that's when you come with no uniform. And Mufti in the army means You come naked, no you have naked week. <laughs> Not naked. Oh, I thought you meant you just come no, with no oh, uniform. No, clothes. But it'd be funny to call it Mufti week and then <laughs> everyone's got their muff out. <laughs> I could 
can just imagine you as a small British child who'd moved to Australia saying, Mummy, next week's Mufti week. And they said, I'm not to wear my uniform. And I assume it's called that because I have to get my muff out and just coming in naked when all the other kids are just yeah. like in home clothes. <laughs> You're like... Stunning. I mean... It would be... It, also, it would be a great... You'd think they're probably trying to help me acclimatise to how much warmer it is here. <laughs> There's, all, there's always jokes about yeah. what British people do in Australia, so well, this is a great one. Uh, someone I know who's British was asked to come to a party and bring a plate. What would you bring? Well, um, some food to oh, share. You, she, she had never heard this expression. She thought she had to bring her own plate. She thought, well, they've obviously not got enough crockery, <laughs> and she just brought an empty plate. Oh. But bring a plate is a real yeah. Australian thing, and I've never heard anyone say it here. They might say bring something, but like bring a plate. Bring a dish, she'd maybe say. Yeah, bring a, bring a plate is very specific, and she yeah. just thought, well, they've obviously not got enough crockery, and she brought her own oh. plate and her own knife and fork. <laughs> that lovely it makes me love your friend because also I've been in that situation where I have said do you want to come around for dinner but we need two more chairs <laughs> we need like eight. we've got like we've got eight <laughs> yeah we're short yeah bring a fork I mean we'll get we'll pro- should we just get bring a takeaway actually <laughs> <laughs> the, ir- the irony of that story yeah is that my friend's name is Sheila so imagine okay. being a woman called Sheila because oh no woman called God. their daughter Sheila in Australia because ah oh, the yeah. Sheilas back of the year couple of Sheilas back of the year go Bush no worries yeah uh, they would not I've well maybe that someone has but I've never heard of a Sheila in Australia yeah. but this poor British woman who was a called Sheila so was getting ribbed all the time for being ah oh, you're a Sheila called Sheila and then poor thing brought a plate an empty plate oh my crumbs <laughs> recovered poor Sheila. Hello, Guilty Feminists. This is Deborah. I'm just briefly interrupting the podcast with some news about upcoming events. Tuesday, the 4th of April, I will be in Sydney and we will be doing a Guilty Feminist Queers of Joy crossover at the Darlinghurst Theatre. All proceeds go to support LGBTQI plus refugees living in Block 13 in Kenya and a Ugandan LGBTQI plus organisation of their choice. Uh, This is a really important issue. I don't know if you've seen, but Uganda has just imposed uh, the most draconian new anti-LGBT legislation. And many of the refugees in the refugee camp in Block 13 in Kenya are from Uganda. So anything we could do now to help them, to show them solidarity and support uh, is going to mean everything. So if you are in Sydney and you can be at the Darlinghurst Theatre on the 4th of April or you can get there in some way, shape or form, we'd really appreciate the solidarity. If not, follow Queers of Joy and Guilty Feminist on socials and we will post about what you can do. But also listen out for the episode, which will be coming soon after, to see how you can donate or show solidarity in other ways. And the queer refugees living in Block 13, you have no idea how grateful they are for the support and solidarity you've shown them so far. On the 5th of April, we will be in Canberra and I will be doing a Guilty Feminist episode at the National Museum of Australia with Steph Tisdell and it's surrounding an exhibition that started at the British Museum about the feminist demonic and the divine. It's an extraordinary exhibition. Uh, Lots of other women have contributed to it as well. We'd love you to come and see that exhibition and also come and see us live at the National Museum of Australia on the 5th of April. For tickets for both of these, go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on live shows. Guess what? You can also get tickets now for my play. That's right, I've written a play and it's called Never Have I Ever. It's about two couples and an evening that goes uh, very wrong. It's starring Greg Wise, Alexandra Roach and Susan McComa. Uh, It's on at the Chichester Festival Theatre from the 1st to the 30th of September. If you're from Chichester or nearby, uh, please get tickets now. Tickets are selling very fast. And you can also get there from London really easily. I've gone just for a show and come back on the same night. Or why not stay overnight and have some fish and chips on the beach? For tickets, go to CFT, that's for Chichester Festival Theatre, cft.org.uk and search for Never Have I Ever. If you'd like ad-free episodes and to help us keep the podcast going, you can go to patreon.com slash guilty feminist. And if you want to support us in other ways, you can give us a five-star review wherever you get your podcast for any episode that takes your fancy that you think was particularly fun or interesting. 
or just tell someone you know with your face that they should be listening to the Guilty Feminist podcast. Jump on your WhatsApp groups and mention it. And now, back to the podcast. Our first guest today is a screenwriter and director with a particular fondness for convention-defying female-led narratives. She is the writer and director of the BAFTA-nominated Blue Jean! Woo! Which tells the story of a closeted teacher forced to live a double life due to Section 28. Please welcome to the stage, Georgia Oakley! Hello, welcome to the stage. Come take a seat. Thank you so much for coming, Georgia. Welcome. Um, She is joined by a film and TV producer. Blue Jean marks her feature film debut. Please welcome to the stage, Helen Sifra. so much for coming. Hello. Please come and take a seat. Our final guest is a former school teacher and has published books on equality, diversity and inclusion in education. She is the co-founder of Courageous Leaders, is on the board of LGBT Ed and has been awarded an MBE for services to equality in education. She was also a consultant on Blue Jean and one of the teachers who inspired the story, she is in fact Blue Jean. Please welcome to the stage the incredible Professor Catherine Lee. Thank you, Catherine. Come take a seat. I'm going to push my seat out a bit so yeah. we can sit a bit more horseshoe so we can all make eye contact so we're not like soldiers in a row. I want to read out a few reviews um, of Blue Jean. From Variety, quietly searing British debut. From... Attitude magazine, five stars, deeply human. And, oh, fuck. That, no, they, no one said that. From, from One Room with a View, Rosie McEwen is phenomenal. Yeah. And from The Telegraph, five stars, a slam dunk masterpiece. <laughs> and what I will say about that is they've come around, haven't they? Yeah. Because in the 1980s, that would have been one of the very newspapers that would have been going, get, you know, children are so impressionable, we don't want this mentioned in the classroom. And now there are articles in the Telegraph about trans people having to hide their identities for exactly the same reasons. And you can almost track it headline for headline from the 80s till now. So I am going to make a great big old suggestion, the Telegraph, instead of having to wait... 35 like years. 40 years, 35 years to get your fucks in a row and wake the fuck up and go, oh, gosh, lesbians are human. And then 35 years later, go, oh, are trans people human as well? We hadn't figured that the fuck out. Maybe watch Blue Jean with that lens and start saying that shit now. Get ahead of the curve. Um, yeah. Which one of you would like to sum up what Blue Jean is about, because I, I want you to put... We've both watched it and absolutely adored it. Yeah, this is absolutely amazing. It really actually is very good. As the writer-director, <laughs> what about you, Georgia? Would you like to tell us what would you like the audience and the listeners at home to know about Blue Jean? Um, Blue Jean is set in the late 80s, and it tells the story of Jean, who is a lesbian PE teacher, uh, and it's set against the backdrop of Section 28, uh, which, for those of you who don't know, was the law brought in by Thatcher's government that said it was illegal to promote homosexuality in schools and local governments. And the story is a kind of portrait drama of this one woman, and it interrogates her life and choices at that time. By promote, that meant you know, it couldn't be known that a teacher was lesbian or gay. They couldn't mention that a composer in music class had a same-sex partner, like, it, it was just don't talk yeah. about it. All conversation and support and openness suppressed. Yes, it created a culture of silence, essentially. But it's interesting that you bring up the word promote because there wasn't really an understanding of what that yeah. meant, obviously. Mm -hmm. But nobody wanted to ask because the point was that there was a feeling that if you were to speak out about this or speak at all about this, that you would lose your job and... You know, many of these women that we interviewed weren't out in, in their lives anyway, so it was, yeah. And our lead character, Jean, she at one point says, like, I'm going to lose my job if this comes out. And that was a very real risk. 
Uh, because then it's like, oh, well, you must have been promoting it, because otherwise how would everyone know? And you're going to be influencing these girls, and she's a PE teacher, so there's sort of, you know, g- girls having showers, and it's all this, you know, g- girls who, in the in the school, who are, of course, themselves young lesbians or question- bisexual questioning, and the, the tension um, of every room she's in is really, really palpable, for, because just her very being is posed by the government as a threat, to this space and her love for teaching and her love of children and, and the teenagers that she's educating. Um, is con- there's this constant shadow over it, this fear of what if this comes out or what if it seems as if I am encouraging or coercing or grooming and just being yourself is terrifying all of the time. Um, it's very, very, very brilliantly done. Helen, um, what made you want to produce this story? Well, I was already working with Georgia at the time, and we wanted to make our first feature together. So um, it was, it was just when I found out Georgia found out about Section Twenty Eight uh, five years ago, mm-hmm. um, and found and out about it five years ago. Yeah, yeah. You didn't back know about in it. Back in twenty eighteen, when we started oh, I didn't making know this about film. It. I, when I read that you also hadn't known about it, I felt better. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a yeah. learning about it. it's like oh, horrific. Were you not born when Section 28 was in play? I was at school for most of the time that Section 28 was in play. Um, It was repealed in 2003 in the UK, and I was at school until 2006. But because of that, because of the the culture of silence... That's horrific. 2003. 2003, 2003, really? So the entire time we were at school, yeah. Wow. Um, so even though it was enacted... 2000 when, in Scotland. Just to, two, oh, 2000 in Scotland. It was a few Scotland's years ahead. ahead. Yeah, always. As usual. But it, you didn't know about it even though you lived through it. Exactly, yeah. Uh, I was, Ellen and I were working together and we'd been talking about uh, internalised homophobia and the idea of the kind of performative element of self, how we can behave differently depending on whether we're at work or... Uh, with our families or with our partners and around that same time I stumbled across a newspaper article about Section 28 and I, I yeah, hadn't known that um, I hadn't known anything about it and I was struck by the the sort of image that I was presented with which was this article about these women lesbians who had abseiled into the House of Lords during the debate mm-hmm. on Section 28 and for a while, we were going to make a film about that. But uh, we went to meet those women um, who are amazing. But yeah, it was thinking both about how that law must have affected my life without me having known about it, and then thinking about what it must have been like for a teacher at that time. It was kind of the two things that drew us to telling that story. How, how did you find Catherine? How did this work? How did you... Catherine? Yeah. Uh, we, we, so it was a weird thing. We, so we were doing research um, when we read essays by teachers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we met, I think, so we met one, one other teacher who inspired the film through reading those essays. But Catherine, we chatted to um, someone called Sue Sanders, who's one of the founders and chairs of uh, LGBT, LGBT History Month. Mm-hmm. And she actually introduced us to Catherine. And so I just, I, I think I just emailed you, called you probably, I can't remember. And I said, you know, like, hey, we're like two young, you know, late 20-year-old women who have never made a film and we're going to try and make a film about this very niche subject matter yeah. um, that at the time we were told constantly no one cared about. Um, and so we're like, can you, can you share your story with us? Because we... We just we we're not from that time. I mean, I'm French, so like obviously I didn't know anything about it. Um, and then Catherine very kindly, we got on a call with her, and um, and I think it was it was one of the founding moments for us because of like yes, this is really the story we need to tell mm. because there there was so much emotion um, and and guilt and just just so much that was still there 30 years later um, that we felt. That um, yeah, there was it, we had to tell this story for her, um, and and for you know for like the new generations, like our generation who didn't know about it, to find out um, and make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah, well, it very much is happening again in a, all sorts of ways. Yeah, I mean, Catherine, you lived it. I did. Yeah. Um, 
Were How, you a PE teacher? I was a PE teacher, and I was a teacher for every year of Section 28, yeah. Or oh 15 of them. She was a netball consultant on the film as I well. Was. Oh, wow. <laughs> to make sure that the netball coaching in it was on point. And she was in the quite film. a lot of really technical netball stuff in there, actually. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. She's, okay. she's the, the detail. You, you know the... The teacher the, of the other school yeah. uh, during the match? Yeah. That's Catherine. It's me. <gasps> Am I? Oh, I love I'm, it. I'm going to tell you. you something, Catherine. I believe that being the netball consultant on a film about Section 28 <laughs> is what the young people call peak lesbian. <laughs> Oh, you've yeah, I hope you got night. a separate I'm credit. Yeah, a separate. cheap peak lesbian. I'm happy with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I think pa- pa- patron saint uh, of patron netball consultants of, of yeah. netball lesbians. And you know, listen, uh, you, you're you're doing the Lord's work, and your reward will be great in heaven. Thank um, you. So. <laughs> Um, so, can you just tell us some of your lived experience of what it was like to be a young teacher during this time? Yeah, I mean, it was terrifying. I started um, my teaching career in 1988, and Section 28 arrived in 1988. And just as Georgia said, it was a complete era of silence and the wording looking back of section 28 you know we couldn't promote homosexuality as a pretended family relationship we didn't really none of us knew what that meant a pretended yeah. family relationship what do they mean by that we didn't know it's just over de- it's a deliberately obscure wording so that they can just go is it it's that it's that it's that yeah. Uh, absolutely. So all of us that were teachers, regardless of our sexuality, didn't know how to stay the right side of Section 28. So we we were very cautious and we didn't, you know, those of us that were lesbian and gay at the time didn't talk about our personal lives at all. Um, got into the habit of being two sentences ahead of ourselves, you know, mm. flipping those personal questions as quickly as you can in, in the classroom and in the staff room as well. Um, Turning a blind eye to homophobic language in the in the corridor if you heard it in the way that you would, you know, I certainly would have pounced on any other sort of language if I'd heard mm. it. Um, so, yeah, and and just just literally spending at least fifty percent of our energy um, managing that bit that is where the personal and the professional collide. Um, and always fearing that somebody might see you outside school and you might lose your job. Did teachers lose their jobs or was this a sort of threat that lay over you that you were frightened or do you know any cases of it happening? No teacher was prosecuted under Section 28. No teacher did lose their jobs. I'm aware that teachers were moved on. Um, Mm. So, you know, we... Back in the day, schools all belonged, state schools belonged to local authorities. And so if a, if a teacher was out or very obviously gay, they may get moved to another school mm. on the auspices of helping out another department. Um, but no, nobody was prosecuted. And, and looking back now, you know, the wording was so vague and, and you know, I, think, I think Section 28 was unenforceable. But we didn't know that no. at the time. Um, and I think one of my experiences of being on set um, during Blue Jean was to actually see what a waste of energy and, and the mm. regret that comes with being so small and timid and, and fearful mm. for 15 years. It's designed to do that, really, isn't it? Because the, a democratic government doesn't really want in the papers gay teacher arrested and blah, blah, blah. They don't want that. What, the same as what's happening with your drag bands in America right now. What they're doing is yeah. going, be scared, be smaller. You've got too big for your boots. What is drag? Like, if I wear, you know, at some point in history, if I wore trousers, that was drag. Women were arrested for wearing trousers in the past. So it's sort of like, well, wh- what's the line of that? And what's glam rock and what's drag? And we sort of know it and we see it. And it but it's designed to just make people frightened. So there's, like, in Florida, they're saying, well, you can't uh, serve alcohol where there is drag. So, of course, that just means it's, they can't really ban a man wearing a flamboyant shirt but they can say, you, you can lose your liquor license. Well, what does that mean? Of course, 
bars and pubs could say, sorry, we love the drag brunch, we can't afford it. We can't afford to close down and all our staff will lose their jobs and I've got three kids in school and like, I'm really sorry, I'd love to support the drag brunch. We've always loved it, but now we, it's to frighten and diminish, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. So this is so... Is this, is this, was this one of the impetuses, Georgia, for you to tell this story? What was the impetus? The fact that it's still so relevant today. Yeah, yeah I mean, when we... The year that we started developing the story, um, the No Outsiders, I think it's called, it's a... When they teach primary school kids, it's on the curriculum, teaching primary school kids about different types of families. Yeah. And they've been trying to bring that in for 30 years, and then it came in in 2018 when we had just started working on the film, and there were protests up and down the country with yeah, kids being kept out of schools because parents didn't want their kids to be taught about different types of families. And I feel like that's kind of where it all stems back to. Same with the drag, what you were just speaking about. It's this notion that queerness is somehow catching and that if we tell young children about it or anyone in any school that they will um, you know, hear about it and therefore become it. But what that completely ignores is the fact that all children need to have role models and um, that was what it was like for the generation of people who were at school f during Section 28, is that they grew up without a single role model. Mm -hmm. And that meant, well, when we started talking about it at the beginning, we were looking around and noticing that there were so many women that we knew who were coming out in their mid to late 20s, not in their, or later, but not yeah. in their teenage years. And that, we feel, is a direct... Uh, sort of the legacy of Section 28 because it, your teenage years are when you, you start to kind of figure these things out about yourself. But if you haven't seen that that could be a happy possibility for you um, and only now, only in the last few years have you had kind of TikTok and Instagram and mm. celebrities coming out, etc. But 10 years ago, there wasn't any of that. I mean, I needed an extra decade on top of that. Um, <laughs> but um, my, that's the year my son started primary school, and it was fascinating, actually, and terrifying to watch the backlash of that. I felt really excited that he was starting school in the year that they would be taught. And it wasn't just about queer families, but about blended families. Well, I mean, my, you know, my family is very modern <laughs> and complicated, and I loved the idea that he would be part of the first cohort of four- and five-year-olds taught all the different things a family can look like um, but was heartbroken to see the backlash and the, I think the other thing I noticed wasn't just this thought of it's catching it's catching but also still this like uh, really insidious inference that there's something perverse and sexual I feel like a lot of the protests were like we don't want our kids taught about anal sex or this. and you're like well, no one's gonna no one's proposed it was never part of it that four and five year olds are gonna get you know, it's well, not I that's wasn't a different thing. You've just about shown about um, different types. And also, there was so much good stuff in it. You talked about what a good relationship looks like, what kind ways to talk to each other. Mm. And it made giving kids the understanding of perhaps watching how people talk to each other, whether in good, mm. like learning what a good relationship and what a bad relationship, teaching people how to get out of bad relationships. It's fascinating. Mm. It was so much more than the sum of its parts. And the protest just got boiled down to. Oh, you know, is it? Are they get, what? They're showing them all gay porn. What? <laughs> but, but they're doing the same thing with the drag stuff as well. It's the presumption that there's all. It's oh my god! Uh, yeah, it's infuriating. It's absolutely extraordinary. Because it's not like as small children, uh, we were taught we weren't taught about the missionary position at the age of four. Just because <laughs> it was okay to know that that was Mrs. Sanders and she had a husband. I didn't ask Mrs. Sanders what she did with her husband. And she never offered to tell me, which I think was poor teaching. Because uh, I didn't know a penis was erect until I saw one in real life. I just, I didn't know. I didn't know. Okay, that is terrifying. They, I didn't know they stood up. Oh, my God. Because no one horrid. told me. No what one told me. a horrible me. thing to just learn went, live. Just jumped to... <laughs> It just jumped to attention. And oh, I my didn't, God. I didn't know. I thought it was fine. I hope you didn't puke up on it. That is... <laughs> No, no, it wasn't. I'd be scared. It wasn't like a Stephen King. It was just, a it was just a surprise. But like I, the first time you see a Christmas cracker, that's also a surprise. Oh, boom, I would you want to know in advance that it did that. I well, I didn't. If you like, you never learned that a hand could like triple in size and sort of come at you a bit. <laughs> you'd want to have known that about hands before you just saw a hand do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's not making the edit. Oh, God. Um, so, so, Catherine, what was it? <laughs> Back to the... 
Actually, it's serious. Well, I don't mean to scare stuff. you, but what was it like? <laughs> what was it like, sort of reliving this through the film? Did it feel like a faithful representation for you? Was it triggering to you in any way? How? Yes, it was. It You're was. nodding furiously <laughs> yes. there. I shouldn't nod on podcast, should I? Yeah. Was it like yeah. an unexpected erection? <laughs> <laughs> I, I spent quite a long time chatting to Rosie McEwen, who plays Jean, um, and she asked me literally about every single moment of my life. And oh. um, I kept saying to her, but that didn't happen during Section 28, you know? And I kept thinking, why is she asking me about my childhood? And, why she... and then when I was on set, I saw the, the depth of the character mm. um, and the way in which she embodied all that um, in fact, she's described as a deer in the headlights, and that mm, very yeah. much is what what it was like being in you know being in school, and that kind of panic all the time that you are going to out yourself or somebody's going to out you, and to see her kind of relive that and be so small and so timid and so fearful, absolutely blew my mind mm. um, and made me you know I. I have to say, I thought that I've not been involved in anything like this before. I thought I'd been involved in putting school plays on. I thought it might be a bit like a school play. And it was very, very different. Um, I walked into this gym that had been pretty much left alone since the uh, the 1980s. And all, there was all these netballers wearing trainers and things mm. that I remember. Mm. So it was very, very sort of evocative. But... Just seeing Rosie's performance. Oh, she's was, brilliant, isn't she? she yeah, uh, and I kind of, I half the time I wanted to put my arm around her and tell her that it was going to be all right, and half the time I wanted to shake her and tell her not to be so timid and to be bold and not to ha not to be so fearful. And yeah, I I think we we. Filmed in the northeast, I think I cried all the way back to Suffolk in the car oh. without the kind of language to mm. to really understand why, which was yeah, there were feelings that I'd not experienced before, um, mm. but then a complete and utter joy at the same time that and a relief of sorts that actually somebody was telling this story, mm. you know, I didn't a, a story that I didn't think would ever be told. Mm. Um, and you know, I'm so so grateful that that uh, that Blue Jean happened, and it's just mm -hmm. amazing. Well, it's interesting, as Georgia says, she said she was at school at that time, and she didn't even know it was a law because it's the absence of something, and you don't know what's not there. You can only see what's there, and so therefore, it's a story that will never be, it, like could conceivably never be told because it's the story of of a knot, not a. But of course, there is a, for a knot to be. There always has to be this underground. Was there anything sentimental about, like, the scenes in that really cool gay bar, the lesbian bar? Was that, did that bring something back? Was that, was there anything kind of sentimental in a good way? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, lots of my friends who are a similar age have, have seen Blue Jean, and we've talked quite a lot about the, nostal the nostalgia for those underground bars. Yeah, that, where are they now? Yeah, we based it on... Catherine's description actually because um, I think maybe we already had it in the story that Jean would run into a student and that would be the kind of catalyst for the story but Catherine had had an experience very similar to that and then had written it down like in the form of diary entries that she shared with us so so we had these diary entries of Catherine walking down the stairs into that space and then seeing a student etc cetera, etc cetera, and the fallout from that, um, so yeah, we we tried to kind of base the bar on on Catherine's actual description. Oh my wow. god! Well, Jess and I were talking I about like, this. I, to go, I do want to go to that bar. Yeah, I would love that bar. To come I don't back. feel like they exist. Not so much, but but part of partly there's a good reason for that, which is queer people feel well have been feeling, feeling safe. safer in just bars where they should be allowed to just drink without glares and stares and slurs and violence. Um, but also, I read a book about, or some of a book about gay bars in America and why they've been diminishing, and apparently it's apps. Because now, much like restaurants have suffered mm. from Deliveroo, gay bars have suffered from Grindr. Because <laughs> you can order in. 
don't need to go out and be like standing by a bar and going, oh, do you think I'm sexy? If you want my body, you don't have to go where gay people are anymore. Where are straight people, every bar's a, a bar where you might meet someone, right? So get you to go. Yeah. So with apps, apps are ruining everything. Um, can you tell us I a mean, little... Is it prurient task? Like, please say you don't want to talk about it if you don't want to talk about it. But could you tell us about what happened when you saw the student with, from these diary entries? Can I? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, we went out on a Saturday night with two other friends um, and we walked down, down the stairs um, to our local gay bar because, as, as you say, they were always underground. They never had windows or... Um, any daylight at all. Was that a case children saw lesbians through a window? I, th I think it's like it they were blinded said... by it, like, like, like at the end of the, uh, end of the, uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, yeah, I think, I suppose at the time, I just thought we didn't deserve daylight or windows. That was, that was kind of the, the scent. I'm sorry about that, but that was it, yeah. Mm. But, but they, were a, they were a place, you know, they were a real place of community. You saw the same people every week. It was perhaps the only place outside your home that you could be your authentic self that you could hold hands with somebody um oh. play pool um yeah. do all those th drink pints dance all of that kind of thing dance yeah all of those things um and yeah i turned i could feel somebody watching our group and uh, i turned around and there was one of my uh, my netballers staring over with with a friend and um i somehow just raised my bottle of beer at her and just mm. said you know hi and and then um Jean was certainly much bolder than than I ever was because mm. we we left the uh, the bar straight away and I I was very fearful that the uh, on Monday morning when I got back to my school um that was run by a nun called Sister Kevin. Um, oh, God. But, uh, Did you just say <laughs> Sister, Sister Kevin? Kevin? That seems an implausible turn. Yes. Of all the shocking things I've heard, Sister Kevin is the most shocking. Patron saint of best names for a nun ever. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> Patron Brilliant. saint of, I'm going to take you Sister to a Kevin. gay bar. Gay bar. <laughs> um, sorry, so sorry. But did the student the ever say anything? Here. Did this, what does Sister Kevin say? Climb every mountain, no. presumably. <laughs> <laughs> but like in an innuendo style way. I waited for Sister Kevin to, uh, to, to call me into their office, but Sister Kevin never did. Because their, their office? Her, their, was Sister Kevin gender neutral? This is <laughs> taking a real turn. Real turn. Turns out incredibly progressive school. <laughs> I don't know what you're complaining Doesn't about. Was like Rob my sister Kevin? Think... They them? No, I don't know that you had a difficult time at all. That head teacher. Was... Um, sorry. Can you just? So you were worried, sister Ke Ke Sister Kevin was going to call you into their office and tell me because of Section 28 that I had lost my job because yeah. this student had mm. seen me in the gay bar. And in fact, that didn't happen. The student came to see me on the cross-country field and tell me that she was confused about her sexuality to apologise for spoiling my night, oh. to say oh, she, was, she needed somebody to talk to and she was so frightened... And, um, and I wasn't very nice to her. I put my own kind of um, fear of losing my job um, before the support that she obviously needed. And I sort of, I told her that she, that she wasn't gay. I told her that she needed to just go back into school, that if a mom and dad found out, they'd be thoroughly ashamed of her, projected all the yeah. things about my own, my yeah. own identity onto, onto her. Um, and said, you know, don't go down there again. It's uh, it's a it's a terrible place full of not very nice people, um, oh which God. I don't know whether you know. I, we talked quite a lot about internalised homophobia, mm. and you can't be a part of something that is a school culture, culture of your workplace for 15 years without you starting yeah. to internalise some of that and believing that yourself. Yeah, also, yeah, yeah. so fearful of promoting homosexuality that you think, I better do the opposite. Yes. And that makes me feel physically sick for you. Yeah. Like, for you and her, it just makes me feel, feel like crying and vomiting, and, which I won't, because, um, you know, it's a podcast, I'm a professional, but that it does, it really does make me feel that, because I'm just mm. like, oh, this is, this is what power structures turning on the human inside of you that just, we are all ultimately in the deep down inside of us, we're just 
frightened, hungry, fucking, fearful, you know, all of those. We're just libidinous, you know, scared, want to be loved, want connection. And if they say to you, you're, you're sort of wrong and you better go down into that basement where there's no sunshine, if you want to be the monster inside of you down there, what are you going to say to a kid? Yeah, do what I just great life. You're going to go, you're not lesbian, you're not. And it's like saying it to a mirror. But that's, that's you know, now, obviously, you are somebody who is looked to as a senior member of the LGBTQ community, and you are, in fact, such a positive role model. You are a netball advisor on a film about Section 28. Consultant. Netball consultant. Sorry, consultant, you're right. Pig, pig lesbian. Now, have you, do you know where that girl is? Um, I haven't heard from her, um, but my first group of netballers all contacted me after going to see the film and, oh. saying, um, and said how much they'd enjoyed the film, and, but saying, we didn't know about Section 28. We're so sorry. We, we had no idea. We're so sorry you went through that. We, we didn't know. You know. And then told me how old they all were and, uh, and, and their, their lives. And, uh, yeah. and, and at least one of them said I was her lesbian crush, which I really quite oh. enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope wherever that other girl is now that she's found health and happiness and wholeness in an increasingly inclusive society and we take this as a deep, important, imminent warning for us not to be reversing that which makes people crippled internally and turn on each other. Mm. All our boys in the band, if you haven't seen that, it is about, written in the 60s, about gay men destroying each other emotionally because they are emotionally destroyed humans who cannot cannot do anything more you know and it just it's this film's hopeful though yeah. isn't it Helen I, by the way you, no you I thought you said like Helen in the dressing room but then I noticed Georgia calls you like beautiful French Helen Helen yeah Helen. okay um, yeah I, I, I go by the two here okay. <laughs> just okay. in case because we can't be trusted <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, French and English pronouns, I see. Um, uh, I understand, because you Helen, know we're just going to murder Hélène. Um, I get it, I get it. Um, yeah, Hélène, it's a hopeful film that you've produced, it isn't is. it? It is, yeah, it is. It's hopeful, but it's realistic. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, what I was, I was going to say, like, hearing Catherine tell the same story now, what I remember from this story is hearing it five years ago, and the... The way she was talking about it, you could feel a lot more guilt, a lot more mm. emotion, and mm. um, a lot of shame. And what I find great, in a way, is hearing her tell this story now, I feel a lot more peace. Mm. Um, and and so, so I think having done the Q&As, like having toured with the film like all over the country and, and throughout Europe, um, there's been such like positive, cathartic... Uh, feedback from people on on the film, mm -hmm. and I think they get that because it's it's not it's not bleak, you know. It's a there's a lot of joy, <laughs> queer joy in the film mm -hmm. as well, um, and and ultimately it's the portrait of like a very you know complex and person who may make mistakes in the film. She makes a lot of mistakes, mm -hmm. but she tries to redeem herself. Like she can't. Save the world in 1988, Northern England, mm -hmm. but she does her best, um, and and so in that way, yeah, I feel like it's, it's hopeful. I think it is. I think it is. Catherine, oh, can I just quickly ask? Yeah, there's some really fit nipple tattoos in it. Were was that like a fashion thing then, in the 80s? Because I've think we never slightly, seen one in real think, life. Yeah, Did I you think, maybe not add a few? Yeah, because yeah. yeah, that yeah. they were fit. Great. That was smoking hot. There is That's, some really. I, just to be clear, the there is quite time. a lot of queer joy in the film, and I watched it with my mum. <laughs> okay, we're welcome. We're welcome. Was I'm really going to remember the film. Was it enjoyable to watch it with your mum? Yeah. Uh, I did get online and order a loaf tin and a new apple cora while there were sexy bits because it was fucking awkward. The oh, sexy see. bits were awkward. You can watch I will better. watch it again. Can I will watch it again so that I can enjoy all of it without yeah, like yeah. sort of needing to make a little bit of small talk while the... <laughs> so, yeah. I did I did take my viv um, at the time to the London premiere and um, <gasps> during the first sex scene she leant over to me and said, Well it's not based on our lives, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. 
Um, so quick oh. li- lightning round. Firstly, <laughs> just need to know this, Catherine. You're a professor now. Are you a professor of netball? <laughs> uh, no, sadly not. What are you a professor of? I'm a professor of inclusive education and leadership. <laughs> Sounds like netball to me. That's peak feminist. Peak netball. From peak lesbian to peak feminist. Peak, les- peak lesbian, peak feminist, peak netball. Um, so to all of you, is there anything you came to say that you didn't get to say? Lightning round. Just that Blue Jean is now available on VOD, video on demand yeah. services. And if you haven't seen it, we'd love you to watch. You've made that sound very sexy. It's VOD. VOD. Yeah. <laughs> VOD. 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 Yep. It's available yeah. on VOD, video on demand. And do people just put in Google Blue Jean VOD and that'll come up. I got it off Prime. You got Prime, did you? Yeah. Prime. Apple, iTunes. Yeah. iTunes. Altitude.film. Is that right? Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Anything you came to say you didn't get to say? I'll say that um, the diaries that I shared with George are now published in a book that oh. I've called Pretended. Pretended. Oh, I love it. What? Will you be signing copies in the foyer? You yeah. should have been signing copies in the foyer. We would all have bought one of those, wouldn't we? Yeah. I can't wait to read that. Diaries from the 80s. Yum, Lesbians, yum. netball. Yes, please. Underground lesbian bars. <laughs> Nipple what? tattoos. <laughs> All of the people thought, oh, I might watch that, should watch that. Sounds like a good film. Yeah, I should, should watch that, should watch that. Oh, we've also got all that Emily in Paris. All the people who did that, do you know why they're watching it? The nipple tattoos. You have done more than you know here tonight, Jessica. You're welcome. For lesbians, for feminism, and for independent cinema. Um, <laughs> all right. Helen, any, Elaine, oh. anything you came to say that you didn't get to say? There's a cool soundtrack as well in the film. There's a one? Cool soundtrack? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 there is. There is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you Super have a next cool. project that you're already working on? Uh, yeah, I do, but very. Uh, this last one took five years, so I'm, I'm, mm. it's kind of too, too early superstitious to, to talk about it. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Fair I hear you. Well, we're excited. We'll come to back hear on about and talk it. about that one. Well, that as fun. soon as it comes out, come on, we'll do a screening. We could have done a <gasps> screen. Do a screening. Yeah, Ooh. absolutely. We, let's, we should have done a screening of this with a book signing. I won't bring my mom. <laughs> You can well, that's one seat. Coma. That's one seat you've got. <laughs> My best wife. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's many best is to me. It's not anyway. Yeah. There can be lots of bests. There can be lots of bests. Um, oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, for now, can I just say a big round of applause to Georgia Oakley, <laughs> Alain Sifra, <laughs> and Professor Catherine Lee. <laughs> You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Brussels White. Yes, and our very special guest, Georgia Oakley, Elaine Sifra, and Professor Catherine Lee. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp, the Guilty Feminist theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge, the producer was Tom Smith, the Scottish Lady Shop. So Rachel Crawford, and Judy Lisa, Zainab Mohammed, and everyone at King's Place, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Itself died a terrible death just before I came on stage. And I'm so nervous that, yes, that it's going to die, and I've got in crucial things on here. So I just wondered if anybody had a juice brick, but I didn't even need to ask because feminism, the sisterhood. As soon as I said I was lacking, front row, it's out, it's in a little case. Thank you so much. Got a cable. Got another cable in case it's not the right cable. Excellent. There's a backup feminist with a second cable. <laughs> I think it's probably more to do with helping people who aren't rich, white, middle class people. Um, I'm kidding. I'm not rich. Um, but I'm richer than some people. Hold on. It, back up feminist emergency. Yeah, it is the wrong cable. It is the wrong cable. Sorry. Okay. Back up cable. Thank you so much. That's the cable for charging it, isn't it? This is, this is scuppered. This is USB-C. Yeah, it always... It's, oh! If you're listening at home, we're not going to explain that. But something remarkable just happened. Um, hold on a minute. How does this work? Okay, I've understood it. No, it's just... A, it's, if you're listening at home, it's a sort of multiple... Would you like me to put it in for you? 
Well, do you know I would? It does look a bit like a sex toy, this. It looks like... Thank you. Thank you. It looks like a prepared feminist who goes, we never know where there might be an emergency. Um, right. Yes. Oh, that's a good point, actually. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.